it still amazes me how beautiful it can be, you know, even in fall, as trees shed their leaves and some of them actually become more odiferous from <laughs> eating they give off a scent, but they smell good. They're a delight to see as they change. Unfortunately, as you can see off to your right, my evergreen took a little beating from the sun. Out here on the porch, it would get to be oh, about 120 to 130 degrees in direct sunlight. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it, because it's hard to conceive that it could be that hot. But when it's 100 in the shade, or 98, direct sunlight on this porch, because it's so reflected by what's here, it got pretty hot. So it killed a lot of plants. We tried to keep them alive, and eventually we had an umbrella to protect them. But Sometimes they take a beating like that evergreen did, and it may recover. Maybe it won't. <laughs> In my utmost, it's interesting because a lot of times people do things that they think is right. We have been given this education that makes us consider our own opinion of more value sometimes than obedience to God. That sometimes we don't say it that way, but we do it anyways. We say we're stepping out in faith, when in reality God said, don't do it, or God may have already instructed us to do something else. We say, oh, it's my ministry, so I have to do this. Well. No, it's not your ministry, and it's not your life. When you got saved, you gave up your rights to yourself. You gave it to Jesus. So a lot of what we're educated on and in when we grow up in finding that we finally got out from our parents' authority and we could do what we wanted to as teenagers, and then we became young people and went out and tried to find our own answers and our own excuses. And sadly, God looks down and says, Man, you just don't get it. <laughs> the reason why you train up a child the way they should go so they, when they're old they'll not depart from it is because you want to build upon the experiences that someone else has already warned you not to do so you don't have to go through it. Likewise, God wants to prevent us from stepping into something that we don't necessarily need to get involved in. When if we would just let go of this, then not only would he be more real to us and personal, but that we would begin to have a confidence in trusting him for all of our decisions. Because the bottom line is, how real is your God? If he's not real enough that you can't ask him over every decision you make, but that you quote unquote commit it to prayer and leave it there and then you just go do your thing anyways. I don't think that's what he was talking about, you know. Maybe it works for you sometimes. But I can tell you, it doesn't work 100% because there's still his will to be done. In utmost, the key to missionary devotion, for his name's sake, they went forth. Third John 7. Our Lord has told us how to love him is to manifest itself. Lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Identify yourself with his interests and in other people not identify me with your interests in other people. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 gives the character of this love. It is the love of God expressing itself. The test of my love for Jesus is the practical one. All the rest is sentimental jargon. In other words, are you telling people what to do based on your experience? Or are you letting God direct them and you're providing the tools for them to understand Jesus in a way that they can personally seek him out themselves? See, it's not about the sheep. It's about making disciples of all nations and all peoples and everyone that you know. You should be lifting up those around you to be wiser than you are yourself. Sound impossible? Not really. You know, you've got some pretty hard set ideas, don't you? <laughs> Maybe they don't. I know for myself, my wife, I am constantly telling her, no, you, when we got married, I said, you will not live in my shadow. You know, I said, because I have a very 
A type personality that you may be affected by. But at the same time, I have taken my A type personality and made it the least of all at times for the sake of ministry when God said, do this unto me or do this as I show you and reveal to you daily. And so I was able to subjugate my personality to the subservient way of being allowing some other one to be ministered to as propping them up so that God could instruct them in the way that they should go and that they could lead their ministry or do their thing the way that God wanted them to. And likewise with her, I, I shared with her and I said, look, I will give you the tools, I will answer questions, I will provide for you the environment with which you can grow. But as far as a personal relationship, that's up to you. You are the one who has to develop that one-on-one -on -one with God. There are things that we share together, and those things we'll always pray, and we'll always get together, and we'll do together. And in the final analysis, I will stand before God for you, you know, of what I have done with you, and give an accounting of who I was to you. But in decision-making, I will always ask that your opinion be expressed, but I will make the decision because I know who I turn to for all the decision makings that I do. And you'll see it, and if you go by it, then you'll do the same. And she's learned, you know, slowly, you know, <laughs> sort of, you know, to turn to and trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, she memorized, you know, and just learned that one pretty, pretty dramatically. Because we have gone through dramatic challenges that you can't face of yourself on your own, but only with God can you endure or go through those trials and tribulations that sometimes you won't have an answer for. But God will provide that means with which either to pass through it, pass around it, or escape from it. And He alone has always been my salvation. So in that, she has learned a way of relationship that is precious to her, that she abides with Jesus now daily, reading her Bible daily, praying, talking to God daily, and spending quality time, which amazes me on just what a beautiful joy and sunflower she has become in the garden of God, that she herself alone has her own relationship with Jesus that has nothing to do with me. Praise the Lord, I like that. So you as a minister or you as a person, are you giving an example and propping up or encouraging others, or are you telling them to follow you as you stumble, fall, and hit your nose against the wall? Be careful. The test of my love for Jesus is the practical one. All the rest is sentimental jargon. Loyalty to Jesus is the supernatural work of redemption wrought in me by the Holy Spirit, who sheds abroad the love of God in my heart. And that love works efficaciously through me in contact with everyone I meet. I remain loyal to his name, although every common sense fact gives the lie to him and declares that he has no more power than a morning mist. People will constantly challenge you to say, hey, you know, you need to do this. And I'll say, okay, and I'll listen. And then I'll go home and I'll pray. And if God doesn't say yes, then I say no. And when I say no, I don't change my mind. And people are shocked by that, that I can choose to not do something that they would tell me to do. For instance, I've had very, boy, I can't even think of how many times, various times in my life as working in different ministries, in different churches, I've had a pastor or a person in charge or a, gosh, who only knows, apostle or a prophet or whoever it may have been, it's whatever ministry I was working with at the time, come up and either give me a word from the Lord or tell me some scripture they had or in some way tell me to become a pastor. And I'd say, no. I mean, <laughs> it got to be so common that I got pretty comfortable with saying no and not having to pray about it anymore. <laughs> because that's not what God made me. You know, I am not a pastor. I have not been a pastor. God did not choose me to be a pastor. And yet all the time, I was always being told, you ought to be a pastor, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. No. <laughs> I am what God has made me to be. And whatever he needs to make me into being at the time that I am, that's what I am. You know, I mean, some people have seen me as a 
techie savvy, you know, really dynamic administrator. Oh, wow, he helped me with this part. Or other people see me, oh, wow, man, he was the muscles behind the project. You know, he was out there busting his tail in, you know, 24 7. Or, wow, he was the guy that was just guarding, you know, the sound equipment for three days, you know, sleeping in a church, you know. And it wasn't hard work, but nobody else could do it, you know. And whatever it was that needed to be done, that's what I do. You know, I mean, have I spoken at times as a pastor? Of course. Or a missionary? Definitely. Or in any other capacity? Of course. That's the easy part. But the choices that you make have to determine where your love is. If you love Jesus and you're following him, you only do those things he tells you to do, not what people think you ought to do. So be careful that you don't get misled or led by your own desires rather than the love of God that he sheds in your heart for other people as well as for Jesus himself. The key to missionary devotion means being attached to nothing and no one saving our Lord Jesus himself, not being detached from things externally. Our Lord was amazingly in and out among ordinary things. His detachment was on the inside towards God. External detachment is often an indication of a secret, vital attachment to the things we keep away from externally. The loyalty of a missionary is to keep his soul concentrated open to the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. To be like him is the ultimate goal. The men and women our Lord sends us out on his enterprises are the ordinary human stuff, plus dominating devotion to himself wrought by the Holy Ghost. In other words, it's nobody special and nobody unique and nobody different that you're going to find out there in the church, around the church, or about the church. They're not greater or lesser because we're all on an even keel. The apostle is not greater than the servant. The prophet is not greater than the pastor. The pastor is not greater than the deacon. They are all men of God under authority by what Jesus tells them to do. Jesus is the head of the body of Christ. As a head, he gets to think, see, hear, say, speak, <laughs> control all the parts of the body. Do you get it? The head really does control everything in the body, not the body controls the body. There are certain autonomous functions that work automatically. Your heartbeat goes on. <laughs> but if you take the head out, your heartbeat ain't going to keep going. <laughs> See the nervous system, the circulatory system, the, uh, all the sensory, sensory systems all operate from the head. So when you put Jesus back in charge, then you find that the body works together perfectly. When you don't, you have, just like a chicken with its head cut off, you have something flopping around there that's just throwing blood everywhere, you know, until finally it collapses dead on the ground. We are all meant to be fitly joined together, doing the parts that God wants us to do. Not what we think we ought to do, or what we think someone else ought to do. Leave someone else to someone else named Jesus. Take care of yourself, and you'll find that everyone else will be blessed by the love you have for them, as you help them with the love that you were given in the first place. It's all about love. It really is.